Tonight's talk, officially it's called, um, goes under the What If Wednesday uh, free public lecture series given by the University of Canterbury. And uh, today's talk is called, What If There Is Hope For Afghanistan After All? Um, bit of a dubious title, um, but who knows, we might come, up, come with an answer to that question by the end of the evening. Uh, my name is Abbas Nazari. Uh, I usually tell people one way to remember my name it's quite simple, some of you may have heard it before, it's literally like the thing that goes on the road and carries people, a bus. That's it, that's how you remember it, that's how you say it. A bus, a bus. there we go, fantastic. Um, so my name is Abbas Nazari, I am a third year student here at, uh, at UC, studying uh, history, political science and uh, trying to learn Spanish as well. Trying. Um, so that's me. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was asked to give this lecture, maybe just because they couldn't find a speaker for this Wednesday. I don't know, who knows? We'll see. Uh, bit of housewarming rules. Uh, toilets are just through this corridor, so if you guys ever, uh, if you need to, just feel free to stand up and leave. Or if you don't like my talk, feel free to stand up and leave. Um, I'm, I'm fine with that, that's all cool. Well, I'll, I'll try to speak for maximum 50 minutes, that's how much I'm allowed, and then some Q&As after that, and then uh, if, if you have urgent matters afterwards, please. I'm um, fine with that, some of you have already warned me, thank you for that. Um, yeah, so we'll get started. <coughs> Title of the talk, There and Back Again, Afghan's Tale by Abbas Nazari. Bit of a Lord of the Rings reference, you might see that across the whole talk tonight, so <laughs> here you go. All right, Afghanistan. There's a map you might be familiar with. Uh, as you can see, there's the Kabul, capital, and where I'm from is the province of uh, Ghazni. Ghazni province, I'll talk about that a bit later, so keep that in mind. Ghazni province, so quite close to the Pakistan border, um, and majority uh, Hazara population, which is my sect, my tribe, I guess. That's, um, that's the view, every time I think of the word Afghanistan, Every time I see a news article or something in the media about the country, I, I sort of overlook the, the fighting and the bomb blasts and the death and destruction, and I, I have that picture in mind. It's, um, that photo is actually taken by me. It's uh, on top of a hill overlooking the valley floor. That's where we lived. That's our village. Our house is still standing there. And uh, the reason it's fertile is because that was taken in, uh, in spring when all the snow melts off the mountains and the valley is actually quite, um, quite green and uh, looks quite beautiful. That's a picture of a front yard. That's my house. Uh, still standing there. I was born there, lived there till I was about eight years old. Lived there with my family. Oh, yeah, uh, my family is here, so if I get anything wrong, you know, they'll be there to correct me as well. So, um, yeah, that's, we all grew up there. We all grew up there, um, still standing still there, and um, that's the, again, that was, uh, these photos were all taken last time I went to Afghanistan. Before we get to that, um, this talk will be in three parts. One is uh, introduction to who I am and how I came to be standing here today. Our second part will be how did Afghanistan get to where it is today? So I look back at the history of Afghanistan, and then the third part which will hopefully answer the question is, where to from here? And what does the future hold for Afghanistan? So, look at history, I look at the present, and hopefully, what does the future hold? So as I said before, uh, born in Afghanistan, lived there till about the age of seven. Um, lived there with my family. I uh, grew up there, had fond memories as a child, as much as I can remember. And, um, one day in the spring of 2001, so June, June 2001, uh, there came a, a decision that was made, and you have to remember as I tell the story that as, at the time, I'm a, I was a seven-year-old, everything was naive and small and innocent to me, so everything that from that day on seemed like a big adventure. So if I look back on it today, I only understand the gravity of what we went through today simply because I understand now, whereas back then it all just seemed like a big adventure to me. 2001, uh, as some of you may recall, this was uh, June 2001, before 9-11, uh, 
Uh, Taliban was still in the height of their power, still in government, if you can call it that. And um, Afghanistan was not the place to be. I often make the contradiction where when, whenever there's an uh, official uh, UN report or an OECD report or an official listing of countries, New Zealand is at the top and Afghanistan is at the bottom. You've got to imagine that sort of contrast between New Zealand and Afghanistan as well in terms of, uh, uh, I guess, um, life expectancy or, or level of, 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 of services or government or corruption, everything. Top and bottom, complete parallel contrast. So, 2001, uh, Taliban at the height of their power, a decision is made for us to leave and seek new life elsewhere. And we did that. Our original goal at the time, we heard that Australia was the place to be. Australia was, had an open door policy. If you could get yourself to Australia, that was it. That was the beginning of a new life for you, free of tyranny, with fresh opportunities. And because I and all my brothers and siblings were all young, it was a time of great growth for us. So we had to get from Afghanistan to Australia. That was the original plan. We left under the cover of nightfall, crossed the border into Pakistan, stayed there, stayed in Pakistan for a couple of months. And finally, we arranged flights to get to Indonesia. At this time, you're thinking, oh, it's all very, very handy, you know, just taking, taking normal public transport. That, that seems all quite easy. So what's the story here? Well, essentially, if you're deemed a refugee seeking asylum elsewhere in another country because of persecution, because of uh, you need asylum from danger and death, you can be classed as a refugee by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. You send in an application and you say, please put me somewhere where I can be safe. But as you know, with the current state of affairs, the UN, they're inundated with applications. They have about a 40 million people wait list. So trying to put in your application, from the moment you put in your application to the moment where you can be resettled in another country, on average, 12 to 15 years wait list. That was not an option for us. And because we had the means to get to where we were, we took the other route. And you may be familiar with this now, you may be known as the boat route. Boat people, queue jumpers. So we're in Indonesia, and in Indonesia, uh, best way to get to Australia, obviously, you know, it's quite close geographically. Um, you, you find someone that will carry you. You find a people smuggler, a person smuggler, and you say, can you get me to Australia? Because international law dictates that once you land on sovereign territory, then it is that country's duty, their legal obligation to accept them as refugees and they have no means of, of, of returning, return to sender. So, Indonesia, one night woke up, middle of the night, Dad says, pack up, pack up your things, we're leaving. Middle of the night, leave where we were, uh, huddled into a bus. <laughs> huddled into a bus and then driven off to the port. Middle of the night, pitch black, can't tell where we are, but you can hear the waves. You can hear the crashing and the sloshing of the ocean against the rocks. Can't see the boat. And at this time, you've got to imagine that we weren't alone. We were with a family, I think we were about with 30 families, all Hazaras, all, um, all, we all knew each other. And somehow we all ended up in Indonesia together wanting to get to Australia, 30 families or so. I'm not sure the exact number. Uh, so we, we, we enter the belly of the ship and we're walking in, walk along the plank and we sort of make ourselves comfortable and it sets off, middle of the night, sets off towards Australia and um, wake up the next morning and you find out that this isn't the sort of boat we had imagined it to be. <laughs> uh, if you can imagine, I think the official numbers for tonight are about 226 for tonight. Uh, it turned out that we had 438 of us in a boat about half the size of this room. 438 Afghans, or mostly Afghans, all wanting to head to Australia. And we, we were on our way and we hit a storm. And obviously this is just a fishing vessel. It can't handle those massive storms off uh, Indian Ocean. We hit the storm, 
engine cuts and were floating at the whim of the ocean. Floating at the whim of the ocean and it is that night when it really dawned on me that this is not some big pirate adventure, that this is life and death now. And you could tell, even as a little kid, you can tell when, you're, when those around you are feared, you can, you, can, you can feel that, you can smell that, you can sense that. And it was the one night, it was the one night where you thought, it's, in all my life, it's the one night where I've come closest to death ever, where we thought we simply gave up and we were simply hoping that should we die, that our bodies be wash up along some shore so we can be buried on land. That was the point we had reached. Remarkably, um, we survived that night, and the next day, um, uh, still no engine, we're just still floating in the middle of the ocean, uh, at the whim of the waves, at the whim of, of God, and seeing what happens. Um, that evening, or late afternoon, a plane, a plane flies over, uh, over the ship. A plane flies over the ship, all levels of excitement that you can imagine at salvation, at redemption, at being rescued in our hearts. Joyful, joyful. And it's flying over and we, we're shouting, we're waving flags, we're holding children up to say, we have kids with us, please rescue us. Plane flies over, does a bit of a circle, moves on. As you can imagine, just like the waves, up and down, hopes. Not just the ship, our hopes going up and down. Uh, a couple of hours later, not sure if the same plane, but similar, flies over, does a circle, goes past. Turns out later on that there was an Australian Navy patrol boat, a plane that spotted us and didn't know what we were doing. Um, that evening, uh, just as it was getting dark, we see this, this fantastically big, great red wall coming across the horizon. Just a huge red wall of metal coming and I'd never seen a ship so big. That ship turned out to be the MV Tampa. And you may be aware of that because that hit your headlines here in New Zealand. It was the Tampa affair. I was on that. <laughs> it was the Tampa affair. And that picture, that's our ship that was taken from the rig, and that's the Tampa here. So we were on that ship, and trying to pick myself out in that crowd. <laughs> we were on that ship and finally some sort of salvation hit us. We were rescued and we were plucked off the Indian Ocean and we went on board the Tampa and as the last person got off the Palapa, which was the name of our ship, the Palapa 2. I'm not sure what happened to Palapa 1. <laughs> as the last person got off the Palapa 2 and boarded the ship, it sank. It sank with everything that we had bought with us to start our new life. So we literally, you know that saying, had the clothes on your back? Literally had the clothes on our back and that was it. So here we are on board this ship and international conundrum. Boatload of mainly Afghans coming in from Indonesia on an Indonesian registered ship in international waters picked up by a Norwegian freighter heading to Singapore. So there's an international debacle about, well, who's responsible for us? Who's responsible? One by one, we climb onto the ship, the last person, 438. We had numbers on our wrist that was written to tell us what number we were, 438 of us. And we stayed on this ship. We stayed on this ship, we lived, and we prayed, and we, and, and, and we waited to see what would happen to us. That's the captain, Captain Arnie Rinnan. He was later given an internationally recognized Seafarer's Bravery Award for what he did because convention said that he had to pick up anyone who was in distress at sea. But he knew the political implications of what that would mean because he was getting into a world of trouble for what, for what he did. And um, there's a fairy tale story because he is a uh, career uh, sailor uh, from age started at 15 and that was his last voyage ever, from Fremantle to Singapore, carrying iron ore and whatnot. Captain Arnie Rinnan. That's us, on board the deck of the ship. We lived in containers, men and women separate. Uh, that's all us uh, lined up for, for prayers. So, what happens now? Who's responsible for us? Because we we're sure as hell ain't going to go back but we want to go forward. 
At this time in Australian politics, it was, if you can recall, the 2001 Australian election, and boat people were the number one issue. It was the number one issue because Australia's had a long history of, of, of invasion, and, and I mean, that, that goes back decades. It goes back to uh, Japanese bombing of, of Darwin, goes back to the Vietnam War and the Korean War and the boatloads of refugees that arrived on Australian borders. So they have a history, and now we're having refugees coming in from Southeast Asia, from Central Asia, trying to make a new living in Australia. So here we are, floating. Still, we've run, run a bigger ship, but we've still got no direction. We're on a bigger ship with no direction, and all the while, we want to head to Australian land, and Captain Arnie Rennan agrees with us, and he says, I'm going to take you to Australian land. Not the big island, there's another island called Christmas Island, which is also part of Australian territory. If we were to land there, Captain Arnie Rennan's job was done, we would, we would be claimed as Australian refugees and we couldn't be turned back. That was the plan. We're heading towards this island. You can see it. You can see it from the edge of the ship that there it is. That's where he's going to drop us off. And, and again, hopes going up, going up. And then finally, when we're about 10 kilometres away, you can still see it in the distance. We're about 10 kilometres away. Australian Navy SAS troops board the ship with M16s fully loaded and turn the ship around. You're not entering Australia, Australia is closed. Okay, what now? All the while, Captain Arnie Rennan, because <laughs> you get charged per day late if, if your freight is late. He can't hold us anymore. It's been three weeks already. It's been three weeks and we're still on this ship with nowhere to go. So, he can't hold us in, makes a deal with the Australian government that I need to go, but you need to take these people off my hands. So we are transferred from one ship to another ship the HMAS Menora, an Australian Navy frigate. Still, smaller ship, still no sense of direction. We go from one ship to the other, and we stay on here for another three to four weeks. Not sure of the exact dates. We stay here, and sure as hell, a better ship for that. It's got showers, and it's got amenities, and it's got food, but still nowhere to go. Uh, one day, as we're getting into the swing of things, I guess, um, we hear news, one of the captains reads out news that um, New Zealand is accepting you. And you, at this point you might be thinking, oh, this is fantastic, jubilation. First question that popped up is, who is New Zealand? Because <laughs> if you think of Australia, you think all the surrounding islands must be just part of it. Oh. And we didn't know. Uh, <laughs> 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 So that was the first question, who is New Zealand? And after a while we, thought, we found out it's a separate sovereign nation and it was willing to accept, uh, not everyone, not all 438, it was accepting uh, only the families and those with children and couples. And it would be accepting that under the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, New Zealand has an annual quota as a signatory to the 1951 treaty. As a signatory they will accept a certain quota of refugees. And um, we were as part of that. So, uh, me being part of family, uh, we, were, we were transferred from the HMAS Menorah, uh, stayed half a day in Nauru Detention Centre, and then flown to Auckland uh, Mangere Re Resettlement Service, as you might have heard that on the news. You stay there, and you're processed, and you're documented, and you're, and you're verified and checked, and then from then on, you sort of spread out throughout the country, and your life in New Zealand begins. So that was our story, though, because we were families, but what happens to those single men who were the breadwinners who had gone alone to find a new life and send money back home. Well, on average, they stayed at Nauru Detention Centre for four years. So while we were growing up, I was a kid, while we were growing up in New Zealand, they spent about four years on Nauru Detention Centre before they were officially classified as, as non-threatening. Keep in mind, I forgot to tell the most important part, whilst we are on the HMAS Menorah, 9-11 happened just throw a spanner in the works. 9-11 happened and it is a courageous act of, 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 of bravery on the New Zealand government to accept us without fully knowing who we are because at the time there was Islamophobia, there was hysteria about what could happen. The world came to a halt but we were still accepted and thankfully we didn't turn out to be terrorists. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I wanted to end on that sentence. Um, 
So there we are. We we uh, been living here uh, 2000. And, so we arrived in New Zealand in 2000. And I think it was uh, we arrived in Auckland end of September, and then arrived in Christchurch in December 2001. And it's 13 years now. They've been living here, grown up here. Went to Burnside High School down the road, uh, University of Canterbury here. Um, that sort of brings my uh, part one, which is who I am, to an end. Um, it's, uh, it's <laughs> getting a bit flustered here. It's, um, I tell the story because I don't want to claim credit that is my story. I mean, as I told you before, I was a little kid. I'm representing, I'm trying to tell as much accuracy and as much passion and emotion that was involved in telling the stories of all 438 of us who were on that boat. So that's my experience of it. And I like to add, take away a bit of the, the grief and add a bit of humor. But when, if, if, if you hear the stories from the same other people, there'll be a lot more emotion and because they understood it at the time. They understood the gravity of what they were getting into. Imagine packing up your life, putting it in your backpack, and then heading off into the unknown, the complete unknown, knowing that you could die or you could seek a better life. In 2012, uh, I went back to Afghanistan went back to Afghanistan, and those are the photos that I showed you before, went back to Afghanistan. First time in 10 years, went back to see what it was like because everything that I had understood from Afghanistan was, was based on news accounts and articles and media interpretations of what it was. And I went back and I, I saw it for what it was, and it's definitely not as bad as what you see on the media. I sort of, that's why my title is, What If There Is Hope? Because that's what I'd like to think of, call me an optimist. That's me and my dad uh, in front of the thing. Uh, in front of our house in Afghanistan. So, and while I was there, there was a bit of, um, bit of a New Zealand, New Zealand link to Afghanistan, which I'll come to soon. Uh, while I was there, there was uh, Kiwi shoe polish. That was pretty cool. Walking through the markets in Kabul, and I see that. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, there was uh, kiwi fruit there. I thought that was, that, that's the reason I took a photo. You don't take a photo of apples or anything. Oh, look, it's kiwi fruit. And I saw that. And a uh, little wee fun fact, next time you're walking through Wellington, Ghazni Street, named after Ghazni Province, uh, and the Battle of Ghazni during the first Anglo-Afghan War. So next time you walk in there, just, hey, did you know? I didn't see this, but that, that's a reality. That's a reality for all New Zealanders. New Zealand troop involvement in Afghanistan. Uh, as we know, uh, 122 uh, New Zealand Defence Force personnel served uh, under, the under the title of the Provincial Reconstruction Team, the PRT. They were working in Bamiyan Province, which is another one of the provinces, one of the safer ones. Provincial Reconstruction Team, and they were tasked with uh, community engagement with the Afghan peoples, sort of uh, hearts and minds, and also uh, civil infrastructure. <laughs> There's a bit of controversy of the New Zealand's involvement in Afghanistan because that's the sort of, that's a story that we get on the media because it's a feel-good story. It's, it, it shows New Zealand is not there actually actively in combat. They're there and they want to get the hearts and minds and they're not in an active role. Um, I say controversy because uh, when Edward Snowden, uh, he released some, uh, some, some WikiLeaks papers re uh, referring to the New Zealand Defence Force and how they weren't just all about a non-combatant role. They, they, were, they were essentially, that was the, the, the guys, that they were more active than that. Um, if you, I don't want to go into the details of that just for lack of time, but if you want to learn more about it, read his book. It's called Other People's Wars by Nikki Hager, an inv investigative journalist. And uh, it might show a different side to New Zealand involvement in Afghanistan. So how did we get to, how did we get there? How did, how did uh, we get... Afghanistan in such a state where it, where it needs um, international involvement and international interaction in Afghanistan. And that brings me to part two, which is the history of Afghanistan. Afghanistan's a country that hasn't politically existed. It's been around for over, the culture has been around for over two, three thousand years. But I'd like to begin my history of Afghanistan with this man. King, king Zahir Shah, the last king of Afghanistan ruled for 40 years, and he died in 2007. This man was the last, last king of Afghanistan and when it was under a monarchy. And under his leadership, 
Afghanistan was more a socialist country, but under his leadership, uh, there was a fantastic, it's what some historians refer to as the golden age of Afghan development. There was a huge movement for reform and modernization under Zahir Shah. By no means, I don't want you to get the wrong idea that it was, it was a land of milk and honey like New Zealand. No, it was a far from that. It wasn't a democracy. It, there was no civil rights. But there was a great move to sort of achieve that level of, of prosperity, a far more engagement with the Western world. So under Zahir Shah, even though there wasn't political freedom, even though there wasn't um, the same rights and liberties that you and I enjoy today, there was still a great level of development. You look at that picture, and you would think you could mistake that picture for any picture of the Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, America. That was that in the 60s and 50s. Same thing again. Com compared to the contrast we, we have today in Afghanistan. You had, you had a, a greater presence of, of, of modernization, and this was engaged by, by the Western world as well. For example, you have this where um, JFK invites him to the White House. So he ruled for 40 years from um, 33, 1933 to 1973, and it was a great period of modernization. However, his rule came to an abrupt end one day in 1973, it was July 8th. 1973, um, one of his, uh, it was called the official, it was called the, his official title was the, the, the monarchic president, but his name, this man, uh, Muhammad Dawood, he was the brother-in-law of Zahir Shah, and he felt like he had been sort of scorned because Zahir Shah was, uh, was, the, was the, this, this man was simply a figurehead and Zahir Shah was doing the actual work in winning all the favours of the Afghan public. So in 1973, whilst the king was in Rome getting his annual health checkup, he, he, he leads a coup d'etat, a coup of the government with the help of the, a socialist or, or a communist political, uh, People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, the PDPA. Leads a bloodless coup, simply walks in, kicks everyone out, announces on Kabul radio that he is the president of the Republic of Afghanistan. Notice, not the Islamic Republic, the Republic of Afghanistan, and he is the new president. And he rules, he rules uh, for five years. And what happens after a coup d'etat, and history has this shown this pattern as well, is initially the coup is successful. The coup is successful and the leadership is changed and however, a few years after the initial coup, the initial challenge, um, there is more challenge, there is internal fighting. So the uh, People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, the PDPA, sort of a communist party, they, 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 they break up into two factions and there's infighting there. And it doesn't help that whilst he's in power, he sort of scorns those people that helped him during the coup. So those people that were scorned, they lead a counter coup. And this man and his whole family is assassinated. Um, and what we have here is a new government after him. Um, the new government is, is, is very, West, uh, very uh, remember this is all during the contest of the Gulf War. I mean the Cold War. So this is all during the Cold War and countries are picking sides. The PDPA being obviously a communist party, they lean towards Russia and they lead towards uh, Russian aid and assistance. And we have a brief two year period from when the, when the moment that this man is assassinated and you have a, a, a large array of successive leadership where the new pe the counter, counter revolutionaries I guess who, who kicked him out they don't know what, what to do now. They don't know how to go about the daily governance and leadership of a country. So there's more infighting. All the same time, the USSR, who is funding their government, looks towards Afghanistan and sees just a failed state on the edge of the Soviet empire. So what happens? They come in. And some of you may remember this. This was the, the, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. They come in in 1980, and um, initially it's seen, I guess, as sort of a welcome, because finally we're not going to have this, this huge 
um, you know, just infighting and, not, and a lack of government, we see USSR, powerful nation, coming to the aid of Afghanistan. The USSR come in and they initially view Afghanistan as a small mini project that could be done and dusted and cleaned up within a couple of years and leave. But what history shows us is if you go in unprepared, if you go in thinking that simply you have the biggest army and the largest number of resources that, that you're going to win, well history proven that that's going to be wrong. The USSR invaded 1980 to global condemnation. Uh, the 1980 Moscow Olympics were boycotted as a result of this. And there is, there is, in Afghanistan itself, people don't know what to think of it because they, they view this power coming into their country, but they don't know what they stand for. Um, also, during, during, like I said, the, in the context of the, gold, the Cold War, you have different powers trying to be regional hegemons, trying to, to, to own their little area. So at the same time, uh, during the, the Russian invasion of, of um, Afghanistan, you have Pakistan who wants to take over the region and just be a regional hegemon. You see Iran on the other side who want to support those people that have the same similar view and the same sectarianism and the same um, religious followership who want to control them, those people. So what happens is, is, is a proxy war between uh, the Russians, the US and the smaller players in the region. And you have a large number of people fighting, usually against the Russians, but all with their own real cause. So what happens here is you see the Afghan Mujahideen, which is, uh, translates to holy warrior. They, they fight funded by the uh, CIA, funded through uh, Pakistan to, to, to fight the Russians. And they were very, very successful. A small band of guerrillas and armed with simply RPGs and, and um, light weapons, they actually um, beat uh, the, the Russians. So they come in in 1980, within a decade, or after a decade, they leave. They come in and um, they start withdrawing. And from then on, you start to really see the collapse of the Soviet Union. I mean, after a while, it didn't, after about three years, it didn't really exist. But again, we, we look back to the same pattern. Now what? Now that this great power that was here for 10 years and there was civil war, well, what happens now? Because now there's no government. Do we go to elections? And all the while, there was different warlords and commanders who owned different regions of Afghanistan, and they weren't going to give up to one central government. And I, I remember there's, there's not one sect, there's sectarian violence. There's ethnic groups and tribes who all show their, their, their loyalties to different commanders and different warlords. And no one can, can simply come and unite everyone. So again, we see a very, uh, very quick, rapid um, change of governments between infighting. Uh, this man, Ahmad Shah Massoud, known as the Lion of Panjshir, he was one of the few that tried and ultimately failed in uniting Afghanistan. I mean, there was obviously more, but he was probably the most prominent one. The most prominent man who fought for Afghan unity, who fought for, for, for a sense of national identity, and he was actually uh, assassinated two days before 9-11. Um, you, you walk around, I'm not sure if any of you will, you walk around uh, Kabul and you'll see big posters with this man's face on it, Father of the Nation. Throughout, that was a very dark period in Afghan, Afghanistan's history because you have no sense of government. You have these warlords fighting over little strips of land and, and all for their own cause. There's no national cause. Who are we actually fighting? So Afghanistan emerges into a period of civil war and a real lack of government. Um, for more like a more uh, personal and also historically accurate uh, depiction of what happened during in Afghanistan in the early 90s, um, recommend you read this book. Was, some of them have been turned into movies: The Kite Runner, uh, Thousand Splendid Sons, and The Mountains Echoed, uh, all by Khaled Hosseini, who's a um, fellow Afghan, 
And uh, these are international bestsellers. I highly recommend these books because they tell a real personal story, but amongst the historical background as well. So what now? Afghanistan, mid-1990s, you have warlords fighting, and, and all of a sudden you, you, someone needs to come and sort of call for a national central government. And who would that be? The Taliban. Taliban have come in into Afghanistan, and what you, here's the difference. Taliban, are, are, they come from the madrasas, which is the schools, a religious school in Pakistan. They come in and they're taught and they're sent into Afghanistan to try and, and teach Islamic, um, is the Islamic uh, culture, to, to teach Islamism and, and spread it, but a, a, a sense of extremist interpretation of the Quran. And that's what you would have witnessed. They come in, and initially they were welcomed because this was the, fir the only force that could come in and try and tr completely topple the warlords and create a national identity. And that's why they were welcomed. But upon their um, taking of Kabul, and essentially the rest of Afghanistan, you start to see very extremist interpretation of the Quran. You start to see uh, an extremist culture come into the government. And, and this is the image of Afghanistan that is, is, is in, in most people's mind, uh, of the Taliban and of women wearing the veils because that was imposed, of women not allowed to walk into public by, by themselves, of girls not being able to go to school. That was in, uh, during the reign of the Taliban from about 95 to 2001 following the US um, invasion of Afghanistan. So that brings us to, to today. That brings us to the present day. Following the um, US invasion of Afghanistan um, after 9-11, uh, there was a brief period of war, and then after that there was the establishment of a democratic government. And um, Hamid Karzai, who is the current uh, president of Afghanistan, he was uh, He's constitutionally term limited to only two terms, so his term is coming to an end this year, which it officially has. And as you might know, uh, Afghanistan is going through elections. It will be the, if, if conducted properly, it would be the first uh, peaceful transition of power in uh, democratic process in Afghanistan history. So where to from here? The, the case for optimism and, and cautious hope. Um, that brings us to part three of tonight's talk. Where to from here? We've, we've experienced four decades of war since the, since the coup d'etat of 1973 um, and, and just a lack of government for 40 years. So, so, so what now? Where to from here? Do, do the Afghans want democracy? Do, or do they want to return to the past under a monarchy? There is... There is a case for hope. I definitely see that. Uh, the Afghan elections at the moment was, uh, had the highest turnout of its history because uh, during this uh, election for uh, Hamid Karzai to be into second term, there was also an election. This had a, uh, the highest turnout. Um, it was largely peaceful. It was largely peaceful. And what's more, the, the, the candidates for the top, uh, the top office in Afghanistan, they're all very well-educated, Western-leaning governments. Both candidates, educated, Western-leaning, and what's more, they, although there is a sense of, of, of ethnic loyalty there, they, it, it's not as, 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 as strong as it was in the past. Both of them, very capable people. Um, there was a draw in the first round of elections between the, the, the four candidates. So the top two go into a second round of elections and that was just conducted. Um, there were allegations of fraud recently and in a historic move, a deal was made to recount every vote that was placed to see if there was ballot stuffing, to see if there was fraud. So that remains to be resolved. Keep you on the news in the next couple of weeks out of which of these men will be the next president of Afghanistan. But in saying that, there is, um, during the last, last um, 
I guess 2001 till now, there's been huge, huge developments in the na a, a sort of national psyche of Afghanistan. You start to see uh, a sort of a formation of a national identity forming because you have a very young population, I think about 50% are under the age of 30, you, you all getting education en masse through social media as well, they're engaging with the Western world. And, and what's more is, in this last election that just happened, the young people, they didn't vote for people, for the candidates simply because they were of the same uh, tribe or ethnicity. They voted because on principle. So you start to see uh, a breakdown of the sectarianism and the ethnic loyalties that so tried and divided Afghanistan for, so, uh, for such a long period of time. So you see greater hope in, in the young population you see greater a sense of, of, of opportunity. And you see very, um, a lot of Western influences in Afghanistan. A lot of Western influences that, that are being welcomed, not just by the young people, but also by the old people. I think, um, I think uh, Afghanistan has uh, The Voice, the TV show. Yeah, they have The Voice, they have uh, Afghan Idol, they have <laughs> X Factor. So you start to see, obviously, a bit of pop culture coming through, but, but more, I'm not sure if that's a good thing, but, but you start to see this, this um, acceptance that we don't want to go back to four decades of war. We've made such good ground in the past 10 years. Obviously, we've shed blood for that progress. I don't want to turn back. But 2014, and next year and the year after are the crucial years in Afghan history because what you see is a US pullout that will be conducted over the next three years. You start to see all the countries of uh, the ISAF, which is the um, International Service Security Assistance Force for Afghanistan. You start to see them pulling out. And, and finally, Afghanistan is being told, you need to stand on your own feet. You need to stand on your own feet because how long can we keep supporting you? You need to start taking responsibility for yourself. The Afghan National Army at the moment numbers about 300,000. It's very impressive, very impressive, but you've got to keep in mind that that's not a professional army. Most of those soldiers that are there are simply there for the wages that are paid for the US Defense Department and the three meals a day. So it's, it's lacking, it's very lacking, which, which, which begs the question, what happens when the Americans leave? What happens when ISAC, ISAF pulls out? which also draws in a large number of very scary questions. At the moment, when you start um, keeping an eye on the news, you see the threat of ISIS. Keep in mind how um, the US went into Iraq unprepared, tried to establish a country, and they pulled out in the last three years and see what's happened there. Iraq essentially doesn't exist. So what happens there? What happens once, there are, there are a few questions that are plaguing us and analysts and historians of political science are trying to scramble to find an answer. Are the Taliban and is Al-Qaeda, who is growing stronger in number and stronger in support and stronger in confidence, are they simply biding their time until the troops pull out to mount an all-out assault? <laughs>